Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this live webinar um, tonight, um, hosted by the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center in partnership with the Bobasan Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center, the Rep Center of Holocaust and Revival Studies, Ben Gurion University of the Negev, and Ghetto Fighters House. Thank you for joining us in this special event tonight, which is the commemoration, the 81st commemoration of the deportation of Jews to Montenegro. Before I officially begin the event, I'm just going to uh, share with us some housekeeping guidelines that I would like us to remember this evening. And the first one is, I'm going to ask you to please keep your sound on mute so that we don't have any background noises that will interfere with tonight's presentations. So please, if you could be so kind um, to keep your, your sound on mute. However, I do encourage you to use the chat function to communicate with us, whether to post questions or comments, or if you have any difficulties or technical difficulties, joining in or sound problem, whatever technical dif difficulties you might be facing, communicate those with us via the chat function. And also I would like you to be aware that tonight's event is being recorded. So if you wish to hide yourself from, from being seen by the world, um, please just cut your video. However, if you are comfortable with being seen by the world, you are most welcome to keep your video on. And on that note, um, my name is Mdu Mduli, and I'm from the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. I'm coming to you live from Johannesburg uh, in South Africa, and I know we have an international audience today. Uh, it would be so lovely for you to let us know where you are joining us from. I know we have people joining us from Mauritius. We have people joining us from Israel. We have, of course, people joining us from South Africa and the various cities in South Africa. Please use the chat function just to write down the name of the city and the country from which you are joining us. It's always um, wonderful to know how many cities and countries are represented um, in our uh, events. I'm going to also ask you to just be patient with us because we do have a huge audience that will attend tonight's event. So as the team allows more people into the Zoom, I'm going to ask you to just be patient with us. So we may begin the event officially a little after 7 p.m. South African time, maybe two or three minutes after 7 p.m. South African time. So please just be patient with us as we allow more and more people in. Um, and then once we've begun the event officially, then I will officially introduce the partners uh, that made this event possible and also our esteemed speakers who will address us tonight. However, I'm going to begin doing that um, when we officially begin. So right now it is, it's just one minute to 7 p.m. South African time. Um, so we'll just wait three more minutes. In the meantime, we have Owen Griffiths, who's joining us from Mauritius. <laughs> uh, and we have Sue Diamond, who's joining us from Toronto, Canada. And uh, we also have Jill Lahouse. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who's also joining us from Mauritius. And we have Mark Turpin, who's joining us from Johannesburg um, uh, in South Africa as well. So for those of you who've just joined us, welcome. My name is Mdoon Duli and I'm from the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, and welcome to tonight's special commemoration, the 81st commemoration of the deportation of Jews to Mauritius. I'm just going to repeat once again, for those of you who've just joined us, our housekeeping guidelines that I would like you to remember. Please make sure that your sound is on mute throughout the event so that we don't have any background noises. And how, uh, for, for people who may not be familiar with how you do that, at the bottom of your screen, there's the microphone icon. So if you click on that microphone icon, you'll see a red dash across the icon. So that means your sound is on mute. 
So please keep it that way throughout the event. However, we do encourage you to use the chat function to communicate with us. If you have any questions or comments or any difficulties, please use the chat function to communicate those with us. And also please be aware that this event is being recorded. So if you wish to hide your face from the world, please cut your video. Um, but however, if you are comfortable with being seen by the world, uh, please keep your video on. So we have Michael Goodman, who's joining us from Madison in the United States. Uh, welcome, Michael. Uh, we have Avishai, who's joining us from Tel Aviv in Israel. And we have Zehafa, who's joining us from uh, Little Britain, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> Uh, so welcome uh, to those of you. And we have Hugh Kitson, who's joining us from um, the United Kingdom. So it is now uh, one minute past 7 p.m. South African time. So we'll wait just two more minutes before we officially begin the event. Um, and I hope that wherever you are, you are keeping safe. And uh, uh, we are going through challenging times. But we have to be hopeful and be positive um, and hope that next year when we have the 82nd commemoration, hopefully we will have it in person. We'll be able to see each other. Uh, we'll be under the same roof and times will be better. So we can only hope for that. But uh, for now, please just be, be safe and take care of yourselves and your family. Uh, it is now two minutes past uh, 7 p.m. South African time. One more minute. And then we'll officially begin. Our team is still, there's still many, many people that we are expecting. So we will try and begin the event with as many people present, uh, just to give as many people a chance. Uh, so in the meantime, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that maybe we can see one another. There we go. Um, um, so I'm, I think I'm going to, my team is, is giving me the go ahead to, to begin. And then perhaps those people who will join us a little bit later, it is now three minutes past 7 p.m. South African time. So uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, all Holocaust survivors joining us today uh, in person, as well as in spirit, um, all ex-detainees and their families, directors, partners, supporters, colleagues, academics, teachers, and educators, friends, and all those who are joining us from Mauritius. Today is a special event, the 81st commemoration of the deportation of Jews to Mauritius during the Holocaust. This 81st commemoration is in partnership between the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, the Bobasan Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center, the Rab Center of Holocaust and Revival Studies, Ben Gurion University of the Negev, and Ghetto Fighters House. This commemoration tells the story of a group of Jewish refugees who, having escaped from Nazi occupied Europe, were refused entry into British mandated Palestine by the British in 1940 because they were considered illegal immigrants. Instead, they were deported to Mauritius, um, a remote island in the Indian Ocean. They were detained in a detainment camp in Bobasan until the end of the war in 1945. Today's event is the commemoration of this tragic history. Join us tonight in listening to various accounts of this event from survivors and descendants. Tonight, we are honored to be addressed by two Holocaust survivors who survived this event in Mauritius. Uh, we are honored to have Tali Regev, who was one of the babies born in the camp and currently serving as the honorary counsel of Mauritius in Israel. And we were honored to listen to a short address that he will give us uh, tonight. And also we are honored to have Kitty schrott -Dill. Um, who was a former detainee and will also be honored to watch uh, a short video um, testimony of her story. Uh, we'll also have the privilege of listening to addresses by Owen Griffiths, who is the president 
of the Island Hebrew Congregation of Mauritius, and he will also give tonight's opening address. Um, we'll also have Claudia Bentel, who is a, hist who, um, a history of a uh, master's student at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. And her research is titled Hidden Histories, Interpretation, Testimony, and the Object Biography. And she will also give tonight's keynote address. Uh, we also have Shula Barush from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And she will also share with us her third generation testimony. Uh, we also have Rabbi Silberhaft, uh, who is the spiritual leader and CEO of the African Jewish Congress. He will share with us some remarks as well as a prayer. Uh, we also have uh, Tali Nates, who is the executive director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And she will share with us her closing re remarks and also share a vote of thanks. It is now my privilege to invite Owen Griffiths to address us. Owen. Mduduzi, thank you very much. Greetings to all attendees and especially ex-detainees. As president of the Jewish community in Mauritius and on their behalf, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar commemorating the 81st anniversary, marking the deportation of some 1,580 Jewish refugees to Mauritius. I'm very pleased there are so many participants for this highly emotional and historic event. Again this year with the new normal, alas, we've had to make this event virtual. We hope that the time will come again when we can commemorate this event together here on the lovely island of Mauritius. Last week, I met a lady who is a Mauritian resident and a film producer for Discovery Channel. She said to me how surprised she was to learn just recently of this incredible part of Mauritian and Jewish history, incredible but tragic. That so many Jewish refugees having successfully escaped Nazi Germany and thus almost certain death had arrived in British Mandate Palestine only to be imprisoned and deported to Mauritius was for her unbelievable and shocking, yet alas, so true. This is surprising, I'm sorry, this is unsurprisingly not unusual that people still after all this time and in Mauritius are unaware of this deportation and imprisonment of Jewish refugees here during World War II. I thought it worth mentioning at this point, as some of you may be aware, that on the 30th of July, 2020, the UK government, by way of a letter to the Bobasan Jewish Detainee Memorial, this is the letter here, and a scan is available to whoever should want it, they expressed their recognition, the UK government that, that is, expressed their recognition of the suffering endured by those people who were deported and raise the question of whether things could have been done differently. This is short of an apology, of course, but according to a number of people involved in the area of deciphering, deciphering diplomatic language, they believe that this is a significant step in that direction. The local Jewish community here, the Island Hebrew Congregation, is extremely honored to have the responsibility for the ongoing care of the Saint Martin Jewish Cemetery, where 126 detainees are buried, and also the Jewish Detainee Memorial and Information Center at Bobasan. We look after this in conjunction with the African Jewish Congress of South Africa and Friends of the Environment, a local NGO that assists us with this. I would like, uh, before coming to an end, just to thank those who made today's virtual function possible. Dr. Rani Mikhail Arielli from the International Institute of Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem, and Tali Nates of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, the Ghetto Fighters House. And I would also like to give a special thanks to my good friend, Tali Regev, who had planned to be in Mauritius right now for this event, but alas, with flights between Israel and Mauritius suspended, he couldn't be here. To you all, a hearty thanks to the Rabbah, and over, over again to you, Mduduzi. Thank you, Owen. Thank you very much for that, for opening um, the event. 
And it is now my privilege once again to invite Tali Regev to, to, to address us. Tali Regev. Thank you, <clears throat> Shalom, and uh, good evening uh, to all of you. I'm honored to say some words of introduction to this moving event of the 81st anniversary of the deportation of the Jewish Ma'apilim from Atlit to uh, unknown to the island of Mauritius. I would like to thank Dr. Ronnie Michelarielli, the initiators, and all of who worked to fulfill the idea to make this virtual commemorative ceremony event possible. Two years ago, when we started the virtual uh, ceremonies, I hoped that in a year's time, we will be able to celebrate some of the events in Mauritius. But as you know, man plans and God loves. I, I Tali Regev, the son of Regina and Dr. Aaron Zwergbaum, who were deported by the British mandate authorities in Palestine to the island of Mauritius in December 1940, along with 1580 other Mapilim who were on their way to the promised land. My father, an active member of the Zionist movement in Czechoslovakia, and my mother, who had escaped from Danzig, met on the way to Bratislava and were later married in Mauritius. The whole saga of the Mauritius exile and of the preceding period is described in my father's diaries, which he wrote on a typewriter during the years of exile. As we just celebrated Hanukkah, I would like to share with you a short passage from the diary describing, describing the deportation journey in December 1940. It is a free translation of the memoir written in German. On the New Zealand, the boat we were on, it was possible to spend first a couple of hours and then the whole day on deck where one could meet with women. One could also sleep there, which was a great relief, but not all was good. Another, an officer who was later replaced used to think totally absurd measures, which he then bestowed on us. The men have a lasting memory of him since he had each and every one of them shown, not for hygienic reasons, but of course, but in order to humiliate them. The height of it was when he did not allow a Hanukkah celebration to take place, supposedly because Hanukkah was already long over and nothing, not even the calendar could change his mind his, in his uh, authoritarian uh, fixing of Jewish holidays. But since he was relieved of his office by the captain on the first day of Hanukkah, he should remember Hanukkah for the rest of his life. On the Johann de Witt, the other boat, however, the officer in command provided the Hanukkah candles by himself. I was born in the central prison of the island in Bobasa among 60 other children 77 years ago. I was appointed as honorary consul of the Republic of Mauritius in Israel in 1966. And representing Mauritius in Israel is for me a real closure. The story of Mauritius affair is still unknown to the most of the people in Israel and around the world. And I'm grateful to all of those who enabled us to participate in this virtual ceremony. And I hope that the event will bring this unique chapter in the history of the Jewish people to a broader audience. Thank you all. Thank you, Owen, for your warm words and to all the participants. And have an interesting evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tali Regev, for that moving address. Thank you. And then once again, it is my privilege to invite Claudia Bentel to officially give us tonight's keynote address. Claudia. Thank you. 
מה? Um, let me share my screen. Sorry. There we go. Um, I think it is up. There we go. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Ronnie, for inviting me to do this. It is an absolute honor. Um, before I begin, I'm just going to give a brief background to my involvement in this history and this research. My own inquiry into this aspect of history started from a research project based on Mauritius history. I came across an article about the British imprisonment of the Jewish refugees in Mauritius, and like many, was surprised to learn of the situation, both from a Mauritius history and a Holocaust history perspective. This seemingly hidden story was alluring to me because of its concealed nature. So I turned to the archival resources for more. My interest in the archives of the prison is directly linked to my professional involvement in the visual culture and art arena. I wanted to see what was left to tell me more about this history. It was Ronnie who introduced me to the Ghetto Fighters House Archives, which holds the largest archival collection from this particular story. Um, sorry, let me just make sure my slides are working. Um, bear with me for a second. Let me reshare. Apologies. Um, there we go. Okay. So um, in front of you, you have a selection of objects in the archives, um, just to give you in, in the Ghetto Fighters House archive in particular. Um, I felt the need to go back to the archives and look at the objects as visual storytellers. I call the items in the archives objects because they are composite of photographs, text documents, artworks, everyday items of use, clothing, jewelry, and the like. To engage in the archive in this way, to look to the visual aspect of the objects, is to tell the story of this part of history, and, and it became a driving part of my research. I started to see the objects as testimonies in their own right. I would look at them and through my own visual interpretation, inquire about what they were telling me. Then I would see if there was any de description and added information about them. This led me to engage in the object biography as a method. Marcia, can you help me with this? So what is the object biography? The object biography is a method by means of researching an object in its entirety in order to establish its placement within a given context. With little to no information about an object, it is challenging to begin researching it. So it is to engage in the object of having a life of its own, often leading to many more questions than answers. My approach to the object biography method is to first visually analyze the object and pack it. What is it exactly? What is it made of? What is its size? What is its function and or use? These are the types of questions which helped me to understand the certain parts of the object's history and in turn, what and how it functioned and functions in the context of a specific history. Following this, I write a visual description of the subject matter of the object. What does it contain? Who is featured? When was it created? I ask myself, what does it evoke? These types of questions help me to begin to interpret the contents of the object. The object biography method places the object as central to the focus of testimony, potentially eliciting points of memory which may otherwise lay hidden. It also assists the researcher such as myself through investigating a biography of the object and the many lives it encountered if there is no direct testimonial account from the people who created it or obtained it. So here is an example of how I began to map the objects that I chose from the archive. And for, um, for the purposes of my MA project, I had to narrow down my selection and I chose these three copper plates, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But in this particular slide, you can see how the objects in their own diasporic form have moved from Austria to Haifa to Mauritius and back to Israel. So then I move on to the copper plates. 
I spent many hours looking at the archives and I was very drawn to these particular objects, these copper plates. Um, why was I drawn to these in particular? Firstly, I have a, a personal professional history in printmaking and the printmaking technique um, is, is very interesting. Um, it involves uh, quite a few complex processes. And I felt that these objects of printmaking and not of prints themselves were quite interesting. They seem to stand at odds in the archive and as an archival object. Um, they what I call processual objects. So they're objects in process. They're not beginning objects or definitive end products. They're objects in between. And in, in almost a rebellious moment, um, they, they start to um, they start to disrupt what I expected to see in an archive such as the Mauritius prison archive. I was also interested in them because of their geographical association. Um, each, each one of them, and you can see on the screen, uh, describes this town, Kogelsdorf, which is based in Austria. And I was intrigued as to how um, depictions of a, a space and a place and a scene in Austria ends up in the Mauritian prison archive. Um, and that I found quite interesting. And I also then, this led me to, to look more into the family who donated the objects in the archive. And, and that is, um, and that's where my research uh, started with looking into the donate, the objects were donated by Hannah Riedler. And um, she was a child when she was imprisoned on the island. Um, and so I looked into a bit more information that I could find about the Riedler family. Um, according to the Ghetto Fighters House Archive, Hannah Fried, formerly Henrietta Riedler, was born on, the, on April 16, 1936, in the Austrian town of Frauenkirchen on the Hungarian border. Her parents were Wilhelmina and Leopold Theophil Riedler. Wilhelmina was born in Frauenkirchen and Leopold Theophil was born in Kobersdorf, where for three years his father headed the Jewish community. Anna had two siblings, a brother Michael and a sister Rika. In March 1938, Austria was annexed to Germany, and at the end of that year, all Kobusdorf Jews were expelled from the town. The Riegler family went to Vienna. Hannah's father, Leopold, was arrested and sent to the Dachau camp, from which he was released after three months and returned to Vienna. In, in November 1940, the family sailed for Mandate to Palestine on the illegal immigration ship at the Atlantic. The British seized the ship and sent its passengers to a detention facility at, in, at Atlit, then deported them to a de detention camp on Mauritius. Hannah and her siblings lived with their mother in a barracks hut in the women's camp, while their father was in the men's camp. On August 26, 1945, the exiles were returned to Palestine, the Riegler family among them. This is the information about the family on the Ghetto Fighters website. Um, I was able to, uh, I was able through a series of networking and um, investigation to uh, get hold of uh, Michael Riedler, who was Hannah's brother, and I spoke to him telephonically about the plates. He didn't know anything about them, but he did tell me um, about his experience in the prison as a child, and suddenly these objects came to life for me. So before I continue about that, I just wanted to go a little bit into the printmaking technique um, as part of this investigation. I showed the plates um, and bear in mind, I'm, I'm only looking at them in a two dimensional format and, and looking at them on the internet. So I shared the images of the plates with a master printer in South Africa who specializes in this style of uh, printmaking. Um, and the, according to the ghetto fighters, the, the plates were what is known as intaglio printing. And, it, and this is how, this is what they were told. The, the plates were intaglio printing and that they were engraved. But when I had the plates um, analyzed by a specialist in this technique, um, Zane Warren from the Warren Editions, she said to me that with, from her experience that these look like what she calls relief halftone prints. Um, and the major difference is that in intaglio printing, plate is um, engraved into and the, the printing block is, is etched and the surface is taken away from. 
whereas a relief print is the surface is added to. Um, and in this particular technique, um, the a photograph is taken, the negative of the photograph is used to create um, through a very complex photochemical technique to create a copper pl printing plate of the image. And then that copper plate is used to reprint the image multiple times. And why this is important is because this technique, the relief half tone technique, was very um, significant and prominent technique of printmaking at the time for commercial purposes. And therefore it points to potentially what these plates could have been used for. And my archival research then looks into more commercial prints and uh, com commercial end products of the use of these plates as opposed to fine art prints. So um, in this particular slide, I've got a very zoomed in version to the right hand of, of the slide of, uh, of the relief uh, half tone print process where you, you get these grid lights, they're very visible. And if we look at this next slide, which is the one of the plates of the copper plates in the case study, you can see those little grid lines quite clearly. Um, and so my search is really on a path of a commercial purpose or use. Um, and then it also, uh, I was then also able to look at the image on the right, which I had sourced from um, from the Austrian Jewish Museum website. They happened to feature this photograph on a section of the website about the Kobersdorf Synagogue. And it, it looks very clearly like it was exactly, it was the image created from the plate on the left. And what it tells me, although I'm not able to find out who the photographer was or where the print was featured, um, what I did establish is that the photograph was taken in around the 1920s. Um, and so it starts to disrupt the temporal locations of the three plates, which initially I had thought um, the three plates were created together at the same time by the same person for the same publicational purpose. But now I'm starting to see that through this object biography method that actually they weren't because the third plate in this slide on the right is, um, if you read the, the text below it, is, is the site of the burial of the Torah scrolls, where the Torah scrolls were, were buried the night before the Jews were expelled from Kobersdorf. And this photograph, then the plate is based on the photo and the, the, the photo could only have been taken after the scrolls were buried. So now we see that that plate, that plate is created in 1938, where this plate was probably created in the 20s and not necessarily by the same person. So the, the, so I'm starting to find out more information about the plates and using that technique, but my other section um, and my other methodology to the research was the, the use of interpretation and how I employ um, this use of interpretation and um, a theorist called Sarat Maharaja's thinking through the visual in order to justify interpretation as a valuable source of knowledge production. So I looked at these three plates and for me, I, play, I, I um, interpreted each one with a major theme. So the plate on the left was a, a theme of place. The plate in the middle is ritual. And for me, the third plate on the right is a, is a theme of return. And so I look at the three plates in this way and, um, and, and very briefly, um, the, 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 the uh, the, the, the plate um, that, that represents ritual and return, I looked at um, particularly in relation, to, in relation to religion and the Jewish religion, because the, the plate in the middle is, is the altar of the synagogue. And so I looked at the relationship between religion and ritual and, um, and, and a, a performing repetitive acts. And the, th the third plate of the um, Torah scrolls being buried, I looked at this idea of the afterlife and, and a, a ceremony and a ritual in, in burying and protect and protect a form of protection through death. Um, and I can't go into too much detail about, about those two because I don't have time, but I, I will show you an example of the first plate, which I analyzed in detail which was place. For me, it was a, a plate that was of place. And I looked at a very simple definition of place, which comes from the National Geographic, where they 
defined place as being location, locale, and a sense of place. Um, and it was very important for me at this point to bring the project back to Mauritius and the Mauritius archive. So I wanted to, to look at other objects in the archive that for me related to these themes. Um, and so the first theme of location, I related to notions of location and landscape and the politics of landscape. And I looked at images that resonated with me that, that sat in this place of location and landscape and what they evoked um, as narratives of refugeeism and exile, both of the past and of the present and for the future. And um, these were the three images that I selected. Two of them are photographs and the third one is a print. Um, and I found them alluring for different reasons. One is looking into the land from a ship. The other one is looking out to sea. And the third one is, is, um, is, is unidentified and it could be a landscape anyway. It's not necessarily created in and of Mauritius, but yet it is in this archive and it tells us something about this refugee story. The, the second um, sort of theme, sub theme under place was locale. And I looked at locale and the building and architecture. And I looked particularly at images of the, the prison itself um, to narrow the scope of the research. And in all the images that I've included in my research, I've necessarily negated the human figure. And I've done this for, for many reasons, but the main reason is to emphasize the absence and the silent voices so that in, in a way it, it, it becomes a system of interpretation of yet so many and, and none at, as well. But in these two images, I was drawn to the one is a photograph and the other one is an artwork and they both are of the men's prison. The, the, the one on the left is the entrance, the other one on the right is foregrounded by trees. And, um, and they both mean different things. Um, I interpret both of them in different ways, um, which relates to uh, this notion of locale and, and building. And then the third theme, which is a sense of place, I relate to concepts of home. And this is where I bring the copper plate in um, into the research um, of this particular instance. And what I did was the, um, the description of the plate told me that this was of Jews Street in Corbisdorf. That, that is how it was described. So I was able through a Google search to, uh, to see that Corbisdorf, the Corbisdorf Castle, which is this image on the right, comes up as a almost tourism bias. This is the town hall. This is the center of the town. This is how Corbisdorf is identified today and has been for many years. And immediately I'm able to see that the turret in the plate and the turret in the image are the same. So I'm able to start placing this building and, and, and relating it back to the idea of locale of the building. And what I do is I do a, um, a Google Maps um, search of the Corvus of Castle. It's an aerial view. And I can see there that the, and I've, I've um, put a red arrow for you to see that the, the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue, where it lies in relation to the Corbisdorf Castle. And so I, I'm able through, um, through digital media <laughs> to, to go into a street view of where this is. And now I'm standing in, this, in the Jewish street that this plate is called. And to my right in, is, the, is the Corbisdorf Synagogue. And, um, and in fact, you can see the banner in this Google image of that um, altar, which is of that one plate. And, and so one can pivot on the street view and I'm able to pivot round and face the Kubersdorf Castle, which is where potentially this, the photograph of this plate was taken and it's behind these trees. And I'm able to then see the potential angle from where this photograph was taken from, bearing in mind that in all printmaking, images and text is printed the opposite way so that when it's printed properly, it's read legibly. So I'm, I'm able to do this, um, this, this kind of mediation and, and using digital technology, I'm able to place this. And I go into the history of the Kogusdorf Castle in relation to the Jewish community. And I'm also constantly reminded of how this is a home and was a home and a homeland. And the tensions between 
these ideas of home and belonging and loss um, and how these are very much resonating within these objects and these plays. And for me, I think when, when I get to this um, section of home, I look particularly um, at the aspect of memory, which is, is nostalgia. Um, because nostalgia is, it comes from two Greek roots, nostos and alja. It means a longing to return home. And I look at um, ideas of, uh, for example, Svetlana Boyer uses um, her interpretation of nostalgia is a longing for a home that never existed or no longer exists. And it starts to resonate with me about these plates and how I, I start to see them. I look at this idea of home and migration um, and how it's both a longing and a belonging. Um, and so I just, and so just to end off, I just wanted to bring it back to my conversation, which I had, I, I phoned Hannah Riegler and I asked her about the plates. And she said to me that um, her sister Rivka had delivered a child. Um, um, her sister Rivka developed diabetes as a child in, um, in Mauritius. And when their family landed back in Israel, Rivka lived with her parents until they passed away. And then she lived by herself until her recent passing in the same apartment. And when after she passed away, um, Hannah went to pack her sister's things and found the three copper plates um, hidden in the back of her sister's clothing cupboard. And she said to me that she knows that her father had the plates and kept them in, um, in Mauritius. She doesn't know how he got them or why, where they're from. But she did say to me, she said, and I quote, he kept things from the past because they were important to remember. Um, and so just to end that, I will probably never know who created the plates and even why. I will never know why Leopold Theophil Riegler kept these particular objects, journeyed a challenging voyage with them, protected them in a prison on an island in the Indian Ocean, and traveled with them to Israel. What I do know is that their histories are no longer hidden, and they reveal far more than a simple answer to a story of survival. Thank you. Thank you very much. Claudia, for that eye-opening, insightful, um, exciting presentation. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, uh, before we move on, I would like to just remind everyone to please keep your sound on mute. We've had several incidences now where we've had disturbances from people's sound. So um, I kindly ask you to please keep your sound on mute. Thank you very much. And at this point, I would like to invite um, uh, my colleague, Ronnie Mikel, to introduce our next, um, our next speaker or our next um, presentation. And then we're going to play a very moving video testimony after this introduction. So I'm going to invite Ronnie to say a few words uh, of introduction. Thank you, Madhu. Good evening, everyone. I'm so very happy to be here again, although it's on Zoom and not in Mauritius. And I'm really, really excited to see all the familiar names and faces of those of you who has the camera on. Um, I would like to uh, present our next presentation, uh, a testimony uh, prepared by our dear Madhu, uh, uh, of a story of Kitty Fruit Drill, who was six years old when she was deported to Mauritius with her parents and extended family. And I was very, very honored to correspond with Kitty. Uh, and I was so happy that she agreed uh, to share her story with us today. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, the video was prepared by our very, very, uh, uh, dear friend uh, and colleague, and our MC for this evening, Madhu Ntuli. Uh, and Kitty is here with us. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really, I really hope that uh, you will all be able 
to, uh, uh, to learn from this video about her personal experiences on the island. Thank you. This is the story of Katie Schrott Drill. Kitty was born in Austria in 1934 to Karl and Ethel Drill. Her parents got married on February 11, 1934, the day of the February uprising in the Heidzinger Temple on Eitelbergergas. Kitty's parents' financial situation back then was good. They had a car, which wasn't a given at the time. They had an employee, two houses, fields, property, and even jewelry. In the year 1938, after the Germans had invaded Austria, the family had to move from La A to Vienna, since Jews from the provinces were being gathered in Vienna. At first, Kitty and her extended family lived in the second district on Bratastras, very close to the entrance to Zenigas. When she was out with her father or grandfather, she was never allowed to stop at the gatherings. Jews weren't allowed in most of the parks anymore, not even the Prata. Kitty's parents and uncles tried to get entry certificates for other countries, but since there were eight of them, it didn't work. Her uncle Alexander and uncle Ernest could have most easily gotten a permit for England since they were still bachelors. But the family decided to stay together. There might also have been an option for Kitty and her parents, but not for her grandparents. Eventually, they all left Vienna together on an illegal ship that rode down the Danube to the Black Sea. In the Romanian Danube, port of Tulcea, they were transferred onto the Atlantic and started the journey to Palestine. The Atlantic, which could have only taken 150 passengers at most, took off with 1,800 people. Kitty's family had a hand-built bunk under the deck where all eight of them were housed. During the voyage, Kitty was sick a lot and her mother brought her to the ship's doctor. All the adults looked after her since she was the only child in the family. Kitty particularly remembers the burials of people who died on boat at sea. In the fall of 1940, when the Atlantic arrived to Haifa, the local authorities said that the passengers should go onto a ship called Patria to wash up. Kitty recalled that her mother said, quote, we've been together till now and we're staying together, close quote. But Erna and her daughter Inga went over. They managed to escape from the sinking of the Patria, which was sunk by the Haganah with too many explosives, even though they had only wanted to prevent the ship from being sent to Mauritius with the refugees. More than 260 people drowned, among them Richard Isinger, a childhood friend of Kitty from Vienna and his mother. Because they had nearly died on the Patria, Erna and Inga were allowed to stay in Palestine, whereas the other members of Kitty's family were expelled and sent to Mauritius after 10 days in an internment camp in Atlet. In Mauritius, the women and children were housed in huts with 25 to 30 beds next to each other and mosquito nets stretched above them. The men were placed in stone houses. Life in the camp was fun for Kitty. For a time, she even had piano lessons in Mauritius. You couldn't get really full on the camp food, so her family ran a coffee house in one of the huts. Kitty recalled, quote, the children knew that there was war and we were always a little scared. Still, Mauritius was a sanatorium compared to a concentration camp. Up until the moment when I learned from older people and from my parents what all this meant, I wasn't at all aware of the situation that the people in Mauritius were in. 
I just grew into it. Close quote. Kitty's grandfather died in Mauritius on March 17, 1941. And when the camp was vacated in August 1945, the family moved to Palestine and lived in a small apartment in Holon. However, eventually, in 1947, the family decided to go back to Austria, where they still had houses and fields. Kitty was six years old when she was deported to Mauritius and 11 years old when the camp was liberated. This chapter of her childhood remains vivid in her memories till this day. Wow. And we are honored to have Kitty Schrott Drill with us tonight. So it's quite an honor um, to have her join us tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie, for, for that. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I will now, again, it is my privilege uh, to introduce and invite Shula Barush from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem to give us her third generation testimony. Shula, up, uh, over to you. Well, first of all, I really would like to thank Ronnie for inviting me to say a few words about, um, about just a minute. I'm, I hope I will succeed in opening. Is it okay? Okay. Just um, saying a few words about the Jewish cemetery of Mauritius. I'm uh, the third generation, you're right, but my great grandmother was not very successful. She was deported to the patria and she drowned. Um, my, my, her daughter, my grandmother, it took two months since she was told that she is actually uh, that she didn't survive the explosion. So actually, I knew that my grandparents, Rosa and Louis Gradman, were in Mauritius. However, I didn't know exactly what my grandfather was doing there. He never spoke about it. I was lucky because I came across a suitcase that left that they, my grandparents, left behind them containing myriads of documents. One of the documents was a letter which was written to my grandfather from Yad Vashem in 1962, confirming that he transferred materials related to the establishment of the Jewish cemetery. That's a picture of my grandfather. So I digged more deeply into it and I found the file that he, a copy of it, sent to Yad Vashem. And under this file, I found a, a notebook which was written in his beautiful, very stable handwriting about how he established the uh, cemetery in Mauritius. And then also I understood that he typed it on a typewriter. Uh, it included also original pictures from the graveyard from 1945. Beautiful. Shula. Yeah. Shula. Yeah. Shula. yeah. Show us the slides. We're not seeing the slides. Oh. Yes, just do a, a PowerPoint and then just, you know, or Ronnie can do it. Ronnie, will you do it, please? Do you Thank want you. me to do it, Shula? Uh, let me try it once again. Just do it on, on presentation mode, yeah. Do you see it now? Yeah, not but on it's presentation. Not... You need to do it on presentation mode. It is on presentation. So, Shula, so let, let me do it, okay? Just, uh, I'll do it and I'll, I'll sure. do the slides. Sure. Just a second, sorry. Okay, wait. Do you think I, I can handle it? I will, I will handle it. You will, okay. Yeah. So just uh, continue to the next slide. Okay, as I said, I found this suitcase with myriads of documents. The next slide, please. And this is the letter that was sent to my grandfather from Yad Vashem. It was written 
by Karmish, Dr. Karmish who was in charge from, he was in charge of the archives of Yad Vashem that was uh, confirming that he transferred materials related to the establishment of the Jewish cemeteries. As I said, this is a picture of my grandfather at that time. Okay, the next slide. As you can see, here are his notebooks with in his the beautiful handwriting describing um, about uh, the cemetery establishment and also um, um, a typed uh, all everything what he wrote. Okay, so the next slide, please. As I said, he added also original pictures from the cemetery, which were taken at 1945. I'm not sure you've got them, but those are the original pictures. I've got like six of them. And the next slide, please. As you can see, it's a notebook with his handwriting that uh, he wrote down the names of the deceased and the basic information regarding their deaths. The next slide, please, Bonnie. Okay, and then he compiled all this information in organized tables. As you can see, uh, they are uh, with the date of birth and death, the city they came from, the cause of the death and the place of the burial. So it has all the details which really relate to the people who died. Uh, translating all the all what he was he wrote from German to Hebrew, I found out that actually my grandfather was appointed to be in charge of the religious affairs of the detainment camp. And he understood after Anita Hirschman died, she was actually the first victim of the refugees of in Mauritius, that they had to build a Jewish cemetery. So now I will be citating only a few lines that I freely translated from German to what he wrote in his summary. Okay, so please the next slide. Okay, before I citate it, I just want to say that he has got also a list which is a very touching information about those who died during the dreadful voyage on the ship from Talsha to Israel and from Israel to Mauritius and back to Israel, most of them, of course, buried in the depths of the sea, which I looked in different archives and I didn't find it in any other place, but he managed to document all of them. Okay, and now to the citations. Okay, so, okay, the, he begins with um, his citation in, he wrote, when we arrived in Mauritius, towards the end of 1940, exhausted, weak, some of us terminally ill, at the end of our adventurous and dangerous journey, the authorities also sought of a resting place for our dead, and made the place for us next to a non-Jewish cemetery, San Martin by name. And then they were challenged, the next slide please, by three main tasks. Just to give you a very short overview, I will go more deeply about it in the next slide. The first was to clear the place from stones, align the area and remove wild vegetation. Second challenge was to provide a tombstone for each deceased. And the third was to ensure that the cemetery never be abandoned and to that end to promote its transfer to an ownership of any Jewish community. Going more deeply into it for the first challenge to clear the place from stones, they actually had to work very hard since the soil of the island was by, um, was by volcanic eruptions and therefore the area was rich with basalt stones, 
So they worked very hard. They didn't have any machinery. And he wrote, we were prisoners and had to ask permission from the commander at every step. It was forbidden to leave the campgrounds. Therefore, the first task was to issue a permit for some of our friends to go to the cemetery to carry out the necessary work needed. The permit was granted and about five people were out three times a week, accompanied by, to, the, to the cemetery by policemen to carry out the most urgent alignment and digging work. Okay, the next one, the next slide. The second challenge was to provide a tombstone for each deceased. Because we thought our stay in Mauritius would end soon, it was wishful thinking. It did not want to leave the graves without tombstones. We asked for permission to erect the tombstones immediately. The initial response to this request was, since on the graves of soldiers who fell in battles, only a wooden cross is posted, this will be sufficient for you too. We were worried. Who will take care of our friends' graves after we leave Mauritius? We were also told by the cemetery keeper that in Mauritius it had come customary to cancel graves five to 10 years later unless, unless otherwise instructed. Well, you can see he was really worried. My grandfather continues quite cynically, the children decorate their parents' grave with flowers and marble, while their grandchildren dig in it, take out the bones and throw them into piles without names, without any thought or emotion. So with unbelievable effort, they erected tombstone for each deceased in addition to the fact that they saw shrouds, actually in Hebrew it is tachrichim, and made sure that 10 people, a minion, always accompany the deceased to his burial. And that led to the third, you can move to, the third, to, another, yeah, to another slide. The, the third and last one was to ensure that the cemetery never be abandoned. I found a, a whole correspondence of my grandfather with the South African Jewish Board of Deputies. And uh, the final letter on the 11th of February, 1947 to my grandfather, actually uh, was written that they inform him that the legal formalities in connection with the transfer of the cemetery to this board have just been completed. And I would like the last, um, the last slide, and I would like to conclude with two points. Being a researcher myself, I really, must, I really much rely on evidence. And I would like to say that that cemetery is one of the main strong and important evidence that those Jewish refugees were kept for five years in Mauritius. And it is also a testament of unbelievable dedication, effort and attempt of those refugees to bring their deceased in the most dignified manner to a Jewish burial, despite the many difficulties they had to overcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shula, for that amazing presentation. And thank you um, um, for sharing your, 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 your information. And thank you, Ronnie, for, for your assistance. Thank you. Um, it is again my privilege to invite Rabbi Silberheft, who's the spiritual leader and CEO of the African Jewish Congress. Uh, for his remarks. And um, Rabbi, over to you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. And it's great to be part of this historic and important event. Uh, I want to congratulate everybody for that are involved in putting together this evening. I remember our many visits to Mauritius with former detainees, Tali Regev, 
um, with with all the with many of the children that were born in the island at the time, to former uh, detainees from 1999 all the way till until uh, recently, our fantastic visits to the island to the Bobasan prison. Um, groups being led by uh, Tali Regev, Owen Griffith, African Jewish Congress, Mervyn Smith, and now Mrs. Anne Harris, to actually walk through the Bobasan prison with former detainees, for them to tell us stories, to, to remember their life there is, is, is quite incredible and a great privilege. And there are many, many videos and audio clips of these visits, if anybody would like to be in touch with us, we're most welcome to make them available. Please God, soon, as Owen said, things will, will ease up and we were able to meet in Mauritius um, for another reunion. I'm absolutely uh, blown by the presentation of uh, Professor Parush. Uh, your late grandfather, uh, Grabman, we knew him as the rabbi in all our research. Uh, in the camp, everything that you said is 100% accurate, which you know that. Um, we would love to have a copy of that death register, that, that book that you have. We have the original uh, death register at the, at the museum of the municipality, but the one that you've got it, uh, looks very interesting and may have more information. We have also original copies in our archives of those typed lists that your father, put, grandfather put together uh, of the number of the grave, the surname, et cetera, cause of death, et cetera. We have compiled over the years an accurate, well, as accurate as possible database of all those buried in the, island, in the cemetery. And in fact, there were a number of graves when at one stage, there was a cyclone and the tombstones that your grandfather erected were blown over and smashed and the people on the island repaired them. And during, while they were doing that, uh, Owen Griffith can attest to this, there were two tombstones with the same names on various graves. And we had to go through the database to see which is the correct one. And we had a new tombstone made. Also, there was a baby, Kite, surname was Kite, which the grave was uh, lost. We managed to find it, and recently, on a recent visit, we erected a new tombstone and the grave. You saw on uh, the picture that you showed, there are granite plaques on every tombstone, because the, um, uh, the stones that were erected by the Mauritians, they just copied off the original stones, and they were not familiar with Hebrew font, etc. A lot of the Hebrew font was inaccurate, etc. So through the efforts of the late Chief Rabbi Harris of South Africa, we raised money and every tombstone has had a new uh, granite plaque put at the base of it, concreted in with all the accurate information. And that is recorded and that has come through the, all the various uh, registers that we found, one of them being that tapped forms that your grandfather put together. So. Wow, and on my next visit to Israel, Professor Porush, I'm coming to visit you. I'm often in Israel, thank God, and absolutely incredible. Um, to everybody, as I said, uh, to Dr. Ronnie and to Tali and everybody who put together tonight, this is an incredible, incredibly important part of Jewish history. And in fact, the title deeds of the cemetery, we hold that in Johannesburg. Um, when your late grandfather did the deal and it made the arrangement with the Jewish Board of Deputies, we have still that original document. And, and we assist, I actually went to look for it just now, but I think it's in, our, in, in the archives, not here. Um, and we assist and we work very closely with Owen Griffith, who's our president on the ground. And without him, we, we just couldn't manage. So bless you, Owen, for all your efforts. Um, and it's essential that the story continues. Claudia, your story is incredible. And if you're in Johannesburg, please do be in touch with me. I'll be fascinated to meet up with you. We have various uh, archival material as well, which you may find interesting. And it's a, an incredible story. And uh, as I say, bless everybody involved. And we need to remember that the story needs to continue. Uh, just as Tali Regev, I remember your parents very well. I remember our visit in Israel. I remember them on the island. 
and may their memory be a blessing and you continue to do what you do so well. I was asked to say a prayer for those buried on the island. El Malera Chamim, Dayan Al Manot, Avia Tomim, Al Na Techese, Ditbak Ladam Israel, Shenit Pach Bab Kamayim, God, full of mercy, justice of widows, and father of orphans, please do not be silent and hold your peace for the blood of Israel that died in Mauritius. They weren't in a Holocaust. But at the time, the British declared them illegals and they were in Israel and they were sent out and they didn't merit to be buried in Israel. And we remember them. We remember the detainees that are buried in the St. Martin's Jewish Cemetery. And we pledge to continue to keep their memory and their story alive. That is our responsibility, my dear friends, this evening and in the future to keep that memory alive. And in the merit of that, we ask Almighty God to protect their memories, to protect all of us and all of you that are involved in this great work. May their rest be in peace in the island of Mauritius as they never merited to come to the state of Israel, to the land of Israel. And let us all together say amen with a pledge and a promise that we will never forget their memory. And as it says, we hear your cries from the ground because there is no justice to this. And in fact, I'm not going to go into it, but in 1999, I was invited to Buckingham Palace and the Queen Elizabeth said to me, you're a very young man. In those days, I was much younger. She said, you're a very young man doing such important work. And I couldn't help but say to her, but your father rejected the Jews out of British Palestine and she got very, very upset with me. But I, that was my moment of pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, may we please God meet soon in Mauritius at the cemetery at the magnificent museum for those of you that have not been there. And may, as I say, may we continue to promise and keep our pledge alive to keep this memory alive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Silberheft. Thank you for that, for that moving prayer. It is now finally, again, my privilege, um, our final speaker of uh, tonight's event, Tali Nate, who is the executive director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Tali Nate, for um, your closing remarks. Thank you very much, Mdu. Thank you very much for all the speakers. What a moving, moving evening. For us at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, the Mauritius story is a very important story because it is the closest the Holocaust came to South Africa. And it is our, uh, our obligation together with Rabbi Silverhaft, with, together with the South African Jewish Board of Deputies and the African Jewish Congress to work with our friends and colleagues in Mauritius to keep this memory alive. And uh, listening to Owen Griffith, to Tali Regev, to Claudia Bentel, to Shula Parush, and of course, to the moving story of Kitty Schrute. Uh, and then to you, Rabbi Silberhaft, with your prayer and words of wisdom and learning from all of you in partnership with the Ghetto Fighters House, their wonderful archive and their partnership, in partnership with the Bobasan Jewish Memorial uh, and Information Center, and in partnership with the Ben Gurion University Rab Center, and of course, our good friend, Ronnie Michele Ariely. Uh, it is important to us, for us to continue this work. If we uh, cannot come to the island, if we cannot come to Israel, we will continue online. Be sure of that, that these memory and this gathering of detainees and their families and all of you will continue. I would like also to remind you that uh, the new website is 
alive. And I would like to share the website with you very briefly, just to remind you this wonderful website of the Boba Sun uh, Jewish detainees, uh, Boba Sun Jewish detainees Memorial and Information Center is here with lots of information, lots of news. Uh, you can uh, visit it in French and in English. You can look at how you visit the center, how, what is the story that you can learn. You can learn about the site. Uh, as I said, you can learn about, about the center, about the history uh, of, uh, of uh, um, just to show you the history is all here uh, about the deportation, about the detainment and so much more. So uh, I will post again uh, the website in the chat. Uh, please visit the website. There are uh, lots of uh, news, webinars, podcasts, testimonies, and uh, we're trying to keep it alive. Also, please follow our Facebook uh, page. So thank you again for being here. Thank you again for being part of this important event. And I wish you all the best, safety, health, and uh, may we all meet in Mauritius in 2022.